Look, Dennis uh, was a professor at the University of Amsterdam for a very long time. He helped establish the, I guess, now famous Amsterdam School of Communication Research, right? In our field, the number one ranked school in the world. Um, and when that school was founded, the year it was founded, Dennis went into retirement, which was in 1997. That's also the year I started my PhD at ASCOR, at the Amsterdam School. So I was in the first group of six PhD students at the time. And, uh, and, and so I got to know Dennis that year and worked with him. And, and then, uh, you know, as PhD students go, you all know the drill. You get to teach your own classes as well or teach sections of classes. And I got to teach the first year uh, introduction to Media Masscom course in Amsterdam using Dennis's book, uh, a much earlier edition. And I didn't understand anything. I mean, I was a, I mean, I was a working journalist before I became a PhD student. And before that, I, I studied history in Africa. So I, you know, media and mass comm theory and media studies was, for me, was gobbledygook. It was like statistics. It just sort of seemed to make sense. But when I started thinking about it, it didn't. And then Dennis wasn't helping. I mean, I was reading his book and I was like, yeah, I get this English, but I'm not quite sure what he's saying. And I had to teach it. And of course, that's the best way to understand anything, right? To teach it. Um, and so I started teaching it. And then I realized this is so much fun because he, he just, the only thing he does is opens doors, right? He doesn't explain what things are. He doesn't, he offers definitions, but then says, well, but things are, can be different in the real world. And, you know, this is just one way of looking at it. Here's 2,512 other ways of looking at it. So it's, it's like for an undergraduate student looking for help, uh, yeah, Dennis is like perhaps the wrong person or he's the exact right person in a sense that, you know, he's amenable to any kind of interpretation. And for those of us who, who, who knew him and, and would meet him at conferences, he would always at big academic conferences sit in a corner somewhere and then you would walk, would, would walk up to him even if you didn't know him and he was like, hey, great to meet you, sit down and you would talk. And, and, and he would have, you know, information about just about anything, but uh, he was primarily interested in what you were working on and, and just say, oh, that sounds fabulous. I wish you so much luck and, and, and off you go, right? And it was just really warm and friendly and kind and, and just open. And that, and that was, of course, when I started teaching his work, that was my invitation into the field. It's like anything goes. Right? This is a field of opportunity and possibility rather than sort of a field where you have to learn these 25 theories or theorists and then you're in, right? As you can see in a lot more established disciplines. Um, the bottom line is, and what I'm trying to tell you is that what always inspired me to be a media scholar is, for me, it was triggered by the personality and the approach that Dennis has to our fields, which is, a, a, um, a sense of genuine joy and wonder at all the fabulous things people are doing without wanting to privilege one perspective over the other, without saying social scientific approaches are better than humanities inspired approaches, without saying quantitative or qualitative, without saying anything really. Um, and perhaps it's because he, of course, originally wasn't a media mass comm scholar. In fact, you could argue that the whole discipline of media mass comm was in part founded because of Dennis, right? He wrote the very first sort of handbook of media mass comm theory when it was still called the sociology of media mass communication. And this was in the 70s, oh, sorry, in the 60s, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, an amazing sort of his history really that he was uh, a part of. And I won't say founding father because that ignores the founding mothers in our field, but it's, it, it's very much an important uh, figure, of course. I felt like, yeah, I would actually really, really want to do this. I, 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 not under my name, but on, you know, make a new edition of McQuill's Media Mass Communication Theory and, and, and as a sort of homage to him and uh, to preserve sort of his legacy. And uh, I wrote a proposal and I pitched it and it was approved. And then I got uh, a call from Dennis who said, you know, uh, I told Sage that the only person who can do it is you, uh, which was incredibly generous and friendly, but that's he, who he is, right? Uh, 
and uh, and then I had to do it. Now this was, I think, about eight years ago, <laughs> and then life happened, and you know, I, I I went from Indiana back to Amsterdam. I wrote three other books because that's what you do. And then I realized, uh, uh, and then I, we all got the news, the horrible news of Dennis passing away, right? Uh, and I, I, you know, I met Dennis over the years. He would come to Amsterdam once or twice a year, and we would have breakfast and and sort of hang out. But, and he would ask me, so how is the work on the book going? And I would go like, yeah, all right, you know, reading. Um, and which was true, but, but it just felt too intimidating to get started. But then we got the news of his passing and, and I saw all of his old academic friends at his funeral in England and, and, and like Peter Golding and Carla Nordestreng and they all came up to me and said, so you're doing the new edition, right? That's so great. And I was like, oh, Shit, I have to get to work. This is, this is serious. This isn't just sort of some, 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 you know, touchy feely kind of thing that I wanted to do. And that seemed like a good idea at the time. This is real. And uh, so that's when I got started in, in earnest. Um, I was scared to start a project like this. I mean, what do I know about all these different disciplines and traditions and theories and I can't read all the books that Dennis has read. I mean, I would be, you know, 80 and still reading. Um, I, I was a bit overwhelmed. I mean, how do you ever do this? But it, it also speaks to something that I've learned in my career that, that I always found really uh, helpful is that, uh, and you hear athletes say this as well, it's like whatever you plan to do next should, be, should feel just a bit too hard to do. Right, so, so, so whatever you do next, don't do another version of what you did before. If you do another research project, if you're gonna write another paper, don't write another version of what you already done. Don't submit it to the kind of journals that you generally get accepted by. Go somewhere else. But that somewhere else should be just a little bit harder, just a little bit more, just seemed a little bit more out of reach. And just do it. And in, in, generally speaking, it'll work. It will work out one way or another, it will be fine even if you fail, right? That's all right too. You can still go back to where you came from. Um, so, and that was, that's how I ultimately got started with this. I just started, you know, I opened the Word document that Dennis sent to me and started on page one. And then had that same feeling again as when I started my PhD. It's like, I don't get it. <laughs> so I, uh, um, and of course, I had done my homework. Over the years, I collected endless amounts of research papers and books and, and ordered them and organized them so I knew what should go in what chapter. I knew which chapters I wanted to get rid of um, and, and what chapters to add. But, but I, just to get going, you know, writing the first word was, was the hardest part. But once that happened, it was actually relatively smooth sailing. Uh, it was hard work. I mean, it took me the writing of the whole, because I rewrote the entire thing. Um, took me about eight months. I learned a couple of things in the process of this book and, and um, of doing this book. One thing is that I got a newfound respect for the way Dennis thinks, thought. Uh, um, I mean, what I always found so confusing about the book is that you start reading and then you kind of get lost. It's, it feels like you're in a sea and you're sort of drowning and nobody's offering you a lifeline. Uh, uh, it's just, he just throws more and more waves at you, waves of literature and references. And that's very much true. But if you work on it linearly and really read it from page to page to page, and his narrative goes in concentric circles, and every chapter draws the circle closer. That's how we, how we wrote. And that's why chapters in the beginning of his book seem like endless, like 60 pages of media and society. I mean, damn. <laughs> Can't you just say, yeah, media are really important for society and vice versa. Next chapter, right? But it's, it's just, but then the chapters get shorter and more focused and and but the, he's basically constantly talking about the same things but just but 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 in, in concentric circle that's how he works and that's how he worked and that was a real eye-opener for me and a real inspiring instead of okay so what does he what does he want us to know 
And uh, um, so, so that was a major insight that really helped me as I was going along. And that's why the book eventually became relatively easy to, to write. And secondly, we're living in a different world and, and the vast majority of the insights in our field today aren't from that, those kind of gender or race, but also not that part of the world, the global north, right? It's, it's, it's clear that uh, our field is now primarily shaped and influenced by insights from e Asia, from Latin America, uh, uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa and all kinds of other places that are now booming in really interesting and fascinating research that doesn't necessarily replicate what we've been doing for the last 50 or 60 years or so. And it's really inspiring and important. Um, so I started to sort of slowly but surely add that to every argument, not always. Some historical arguments are left intact, but basically all the new stuff is, um, I would challenge you to find a white guy. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a couple, <laughs> but not that many. Uh, and it's not because I'm trying to be politically correct or something like that, or, you know, uh, uh, um, um, it's just simply that's a reflection of how the field looks today. As some of you may know, uh, you know, my, my original research was always on the, the production uh, part of the media taxonomy of production content reception. Um, so I've, 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 paid more attention to media work and media production and media management and how media industries work on a global scale. Also because in my experience, the vast majority of students who have to work with stuff like this are in classes like this because they wanna work in the media, especially on an undergraduate level. Um, in the end, um, I try to rewrite the entire section on media effects theories. Um, and that, the reason for that was primarily because I wanted this book not to be a social science handbook. Um, and of course, our friends in social science talk about media effects and, and our friends in, in media and cultural studies talk about media impact or media influence uh, or, or mediatization or media saturate. They have way more terms for, for pretty much the same phenomenon. And, um, um, and, 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 and I wanted to integrate those two perspectives without privileging either or, and without setting them side by side. Um, so this is not a book where I say, well, the social science say, say this, and then the humanities people say that. No, it's completely integrated without listing either or. And it's very, that was very deliberate um, uh, because in our field, all the big guns, the Sonia Livingstons of this world, uh, the, 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 the Clays de Vraises of this world, um, uh, the Terry Flues of this world, like the, the, the biggest names in our field, uh, have all in the last couple of years been advocating um, um, that, that in order for our field to move forward, it needs to embrace more deliberately, you know, triangulation, mixed method approaches, uh, integrated perspectives. And that's a beautiful sentiment but who's actually doing this? And for those who are doing this, how many of those are actually acknowledging how bloody damn hard that is to really combine methods, to be well-versed in multiple methods or to get a team together from people from different disciplinary backgrounds that are still high-fiving halfway through the project? That's tough, that's really tough. And, and uh, so I wanted to, to see if I could make it work. But um, so for me, it always made sense to just to, to treat everything like a bunch of, uh, you know, a balls that a juggler would keep up in the air. It's like something to play with. So I guess that's a, a, a third element and uh, this integrated perspective. And uh, as a final comment, um, when I read, wrote the epilogue of the book, I was thinking like, so what is the, what is the point really, right? What is the overall uh, uh, message that, that, that I've picked up from this or that, um, um, uh, that could be, yeah, um, could be taken away? What's the, in the book I call it, what's the grand narrative of the field of media and mass communication? And, 
I do feel that the grand narrative, and, and, and I'm very much influenced by the kind of social theory that, I'm, that I really uh, 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 like, which is the work of, of sort of the, the, the theorist of late or second or liquid modernity, like the work of Giddens and Baumann and Beck and those kind of uh, uh, thinkers. Um, but, but that the grand narrative is that most of what we know about media mass communication and how it works is based on a set of assumptions that have in common that these categories are stable, right? That there's a category called media production that happens in movie studios and newsrooms and so on, and ad agencies uh, or game development studios, that there's a category of content, right? That consists of a, a film or a piece of music or a book or a magazine or those kind of things. And that there's a category of audiences or reception or publics or whatever you want to call it, where people, you know, go out and, and, and see a film or buy a book and then read it or watch it and talk about it and, and give meaning to it. And that these three categories all have their own sort of characteristics in terms of what makes them work and, and how we can study them. They have their own range of methods that, uh, um, that they have certain um, conventions, uh, like for example, with content, we talk about content in terms of genres and those kind of things. Um, and that enables them us to sort of get a, get a handle on them, get a, get a grip. And, and what all of this, what is happening to all of these three things is not that they're gone, it's just that those stable categories, the stable elements that form these categories have begun to shift. Uh, if you if you're want to talk about this in industrial terms, you say they're being disrupted, um, they're liquefied, they are, they are moving. So yes, there's still media production, but most of that you and I are doing at home, right? When we switch on a computer, we're already making media because every keystroke sends data somewhere that ends up in a database somewhere that benefits someone, right? That's media production right there. Uh, and that leaves alone every app we send, every email that we compose, every like or tweet or favorite or vlog or whatever. Um, so, so yeah, that's all now media production. Acts of consumption have become production. And content, what is content actually? Content is this sort of floating signifier, if you want to be fancy about it. I mean, over 10 years ago, the advertising industry was talking about the prim premise of liquid media. The notion of media sort of flowing across different channels, adapting themselves to whatever technological uh, or usability uh, parameters would be changing, uh, um, uh, content being different from one computer to the next, from one smart television to the next based on the user data that was available at the time. And that kind of content is what we're seeing right now. Every journalist right now will tell you that he or she doesn't make finished stories anymore they build stories that are constantly changing and they get new headlines, new edits, new pictures, new adaptations, new, they do A-B testing. It's, it's like a story is almost never finished. So content has also become this sort of floating liquid thing. And, and of course, uh, what is media consumption today? Because we are consuming media, but that, that, that consumption takes place along all kinds of other things. I mean, back in the day, the industry would value itself on the basis of ratings, right? How many, and, and how many people would subscribe to your newspaper or, or buy a movie ticket or tune into a television show. That was the currency of the industry. Now that currency still exists, but it has first shifted towards time spent, right? It's, it doesn't matter that a lot of people watch your show, but if they all stop watching after a minute, yeah, well, that. <laughs> That's kind of pointless. Okay, let's start measuring how much time people actually spend with, and that's of course a devastating metric that has caused the advertising revenue of the most industries to plummet because most people don't spend much time with anything. But all right, time spent. And what is the major currency today? Engagement. And actually what is engagement? It's media production, right? So the currency of media consumption has become media production. It's not valuable that somebody watches your TV show. It's only valuable when they also tweet about it, 
right? It's, the industry would call it second screen engagement, right? So, so it's, 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 for me, it's fascinating that, that the grand narrative of our field is that the categories that we've made up, production, content, reception, are still there, but they all mean, in, in various instances, the same thing. Um, they collapse, they move around, they're like floating, they're like, they're in, they're in movement. They are, and, and that's, that is the grand narrative. That is what we're, that's what we're studying. We're studying a moving object. And perhaps if you're metaphysically inclined, we've always done that. It's just that now it becomes almost impossible to maintain that there is such a thing as a media text, that there is such a thing as a media audience, that there is such a thing as a media maker. It, it's all at, it's all messed up, and that that's I think that's a really exciting idea. What kind of methods belong to studying that? How do you capture that? How can you make an, an interesting statement about that? So um, um, I think that that kind of fluid or liquid perspective on the main categories for me is the key challenge to our field. And so when I start work on the next edition. <clears throat> <laughs> I'll be back five years from now. Um, that sh that that that's where it starts. Should start. That I think that's the the key. So how has our field been able to sort of deal with this fluid, liquid media environment um, 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 and that we're in? And there are all already really interesting concepts. Uh, concepts like transmedia and convergence culture and co-creation and i mean there's so many interesting concepts that are already out there i mean the whole shift in our field both in the humanities and social sciences towards looking more at embodied or effective notions of media use and production right that is i mean if you study affect as the humanities does do or embodied cognition as the social scientists do which is the same thing right it's just the one expressed in different ways it, the moment you start studying that you embrace the notion that what you're studying is never exactly the same from one second to the next right because our bodies are never the same the way we process emotions is never the same it it is always different and that's that's so you have to come up with models either through multivariate models or uh, conceptual models to accommodate that kind of transition, that movement, that dynamism. So it's already happening throughout our field. And I think that's, that's a really exciting challenge. That's, that's going to be so much fun.